our politics is known for the predominance of uh, dynastic clans in the political system. And they are present in all of the local governments. And some of them have been supportive of the process, but most of them, of course, view this as some kind of a threat to the powers that, the, that they had enjoyed over decades. And it's in that sense that the electoral process has been characterized by a lot of violence, a use of violence, guns, guns and goats, the three Gs as we call these. Philippine election officials urge police to crack down on loose firearms as violence mars the campaign for next week's Village and Youth Council polls. And we think that this will be at play when elections happen in 2025. Today we embrace peace with the crushing might of a people and banish war with the great power of a nation united. No more war, no more children scampering for safety, no more evacuees, no more lost school days or school months, no more injustice, no more misgovernance, no more poverty, no more fear and no more want. So I, I chaired the government panel, starting as a senior member and then eventually becoming the chair and then signing the agreement. Professor Miriam Coronel Ferrer and Mr. Mohaghar Iqbal, the Peace Panel Chairs. It took us 17 years to sign an agreement after so many precedents. Maybe it's all of this politics, domestic politics that's coming in interfering in the process, but what that I can say is that the parties have stayed the track, they've stayed the course, and that's the most important thing. They have become partners, both for peace and development and greater security. Doesn't mean everything is perfect. There are still a lot of other problems in the region, including the presence of other armed groups, uh, violent extremist groups, and we have seen in the last series that how much that has confounded the problem. There are, of course, the greater challenge of being able, really, to bring the promise, you know, peace dividends in the lives of the people, which meant that the development issues, uh, the functioning of the whole bureaucracy, these are now in the hands of the leadership of the more Islamic Liberation Front, being at the helm of the transition government. But in any case, the MILF is, was the largest armed group, and with the most consolidated forces. And having this process with the, them and having being partners with them on peace, security, and development issues means a lot in terms precisely of the potential for uh, really building more sustainable peace, even if it takes a long time. We had a lack of expectations that the 21st century would usher in more peace coming in from the 1990s where you had several uh, successful peace processes. But as we saw, as the decades poured in, you saw increasingly uh, less and less comprehensive peace agreements that have been sustained uh, really uh, taking shape. Uh, you had, of course, coming in in uh, Sudan, Aceh, Nepal, and then very, after a long time, you have our, our peace agreement 2014 with a comprehensive agreement of the Bank Samora and Colombia in 2016. But since then, it's been a very, you know, poor harvest of successful processes. And I think uh, the fact that we have signed an agreement and provided the, the parameters where you are able to correct historical injustice and allow for good governance um, framework shows that it can be done. And in that sense, it offers also some kind of uh, model, not in its entirety because each conflict is different, but perhaps elements of each, including, of course, our long experience with the ceasefire. And I think that that's a contribution that um, we have given to the world. First, the hope, the hope and the evidence <laughs> that it can be done and it can have women participating in it. It can be a process, in fact, that where one party is led by women and with a lot of women in the team. And, and that's a success story uh, in, in so many ways. And um, it's our contribution to, to this whole endeavor for greater peace in the world.